It is a beautiful day to be alive, and I'm so glad we have this time together. I'm Sana Laybourne, she, her. I am a professor, scholar, connector, and avid reader. I've always loved learning about what's happening in our social world and sharing that knowledge, especially over a good cup of coffee. And so here we are. Each week on Let's Grab Coffee, I catch up with experts from around the world who are investigating our most pressing social issues and common curiosities. This month, it is my immense honor to welcome back Dominic Lawson. He is the creator and host of the multi-award-winning Black is America podcast, which highlights little-known African-American figures and stories. Black is America helps tell the story of America through the lens of the African-American experience. Before launching Black is America, Dominic was the creator and host of the Startup Life podcast, which provided listeners with the edge they needed in building their businesses and climbing the corporate ladder. The Startup Life featured interviews with an array of entrepreneurs and business owners and was syndicated nationally and internationally. Currently, Dominic is the podcast producer, editor, and host for Meadows Behavioral Healthcare. He hosts the long-running series Beyond Theory podcast that brings in-depth conversations with firsthand insights from the people on the front lines of mental health and addiction recovery. He's also the host of the award-winning podcast Recovery Replay, which journals personal stories of recovery. I could not be more excited to have Dominic Lawson back with us this month. We will be featuring episodes of of Black is America, and Dominic and I also will be giving you a little bit of insight behind the scenes for some of the episodes, also behind the scenes of podcasting and behind the scenes of our lives in general. And so it's going to be a great month together. Welcome, Dominic. Thank you so much for saying yes and being so generous with this amazing show that you've created and allowing me, allowing WYXR to dig into these episodes. They're just so good. And I could not be happier that we're going to spend this month together well i just want to say thank you so much again for having me i i I loved doing this last year and uh it looks like we get to do it again this year so i'm looking forward to it uh wow it's uh it's been an amazing ride uh since last year so i know we got a lot to catch up on but i'm looking forward to it uh hanging out with you again this month yeah i mean oh my goodness so much can happen in a year Let's get into it because I I said, you know, award winning and I think people like don't understand what that can mean, you know, because there's awards for everything. But I want you to first of all, give me the count because I told you I cannot keep up with all of the recognition that you're getting so well deserved and beyond. So first, just give us the, the counts of how many awards has Black is America accumulated thus far. And this is just the count for today. Okay, so keep up people. (laughs) Right. Uh, As of right now, Black as America has uh, 18 national awards uh, from a web to signals to communicators to W3s. Uh, uh, 18 is is the count so far. 18 is the count so far. And give us some more context. Um, Mm -hmm. What are some of the different awards for as far as what specific aspects of the episodes or podcasting more broadly? And then also, could you contextualize it for us in terms of like what these awards really mean? Sure. So like I said, you know, all of them are different national level awards. For instance, the Webby uh, is probably the crown jewel here in the trophy case, uh, as it's uh, depending on you know, who you ask. But the New York Times says it's the Oscars of the Internet, if you will. So okay, uh, come on. <laughs> that, that, that's what they say. And so um, with that one, uh, we won for uh, the feature that we we feature here on WYXR. Let's grab coffee last year. Uh, the Tom Lee episode. The Tom <sighs> Lee episode was was really good, so good that it was in the same category as ESPN, uh, Slate Magazine, Travel Oregon, Lemonada, and we came home with the uh, with the Webby, and so uh, <laughs> in the uh, the People's Choice category, if you will, for the Webby. So it was it was an honor. 
and so that afforded me and my wife, Kendall Lawson, who also serves as executive producer for Black is America, uh, to go to New York for the event gala, for the awards gala. And we got to uh, kind of hobnob with, you know, Tracy Ellis Ross and Toby Nwigway and SZA. I mean, I got a name drop. We don't, we, we don't <laughs> let's grab coffee. I got to do a little bit of name That's drop. That's right. Here. Give us some but, tea. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you know. Well, I mean, the security detail won't let us get too close, but, you know, but it was, but it was still kind of cool to be uh, in, in the room with them. But also, we did get to sit at the table with uh, uh, some people from MSNBC and also the NAACP. We were able to kind of talk to them network and stuff like that msnbc may want to do like some uh some uh some swapping on rss feeds here so that's okay. kind of cool with their show in black is america uh so that's well so that's probably the crown jewel where you got to go to new york and stuff like that uh the other one, uh, the signals. The signals are they're kind of a new uh award type of uh scenario here. Uh but again, still on the national scene, we was in the same category as CBS News and stuff like that. If you're familiar with Mo Rocca, his podcast was in that category as well. And uh, we were able to come home with six signal awards in that regard. Uh, and that was really cool. Uh, and actually was able to go back to New York for another awards gala in, in that regard. So, yeah, it was a lot of fun. Uh was able to, again, kind of chop it up with, you know, people from Wondery and Audible. Again, these are the who's who uh, in podcasting in our game. And you get to kind of, you know... Uh, you know, share finger sandwiches with them <laughs> so at, the, at the Bowery Hotel in Manhattan. Uh, so, uh, but again, it just goes to show how cool podcasting has has benefited me, benefited my family, uh, and stuff like that. And then the W three and the communicators they they didn't afford me a trip to New York or anything like that. But again, uh, still on the national stage and uh, and and things of that nature. And in addition to that. Uh, so no, we we actually won uh, for my uh, employer Meadows Behavioral Healthcare, which you was talking about earlier. Uh, got them some hardware too, uh, as well. So you know, recovery replay, but also Black uh, Beyond Theory, as well. We did an episode about racial trauma within the Black community that was very important and, and got us a gold communicator award as well. So black is America. 18 is the total count but for, for black is America is 18. Uh, but for me personally, it's 22 altogether. Whoa, 22. Come 22. on. Come through with Emma Smith, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was just so important for me to have you explain because for folks who maybe aren't familiar with how, you know, important, impactful podcasting is, I think that's important for folks to understand that how people are getting information now very much through podcasts, right? Through what right. some people might think of as alternate sources of media, but it is very central to how we're connecting with one another, how we're thinking through different social issues. Uh, but I also think, of course, how we are storytelling and those right. stories that we tell about ourselves to ourselves have a lot of meaning and definitely shape um, our present, shape what we're thinking about for our future as well. And so I just thought it was really important for folks to understand Stand, like kind of the landscape of podcasting a little bit right. and then who you are within right. it and of course for me you know as a Memphian I just think it's so amazing that we have you you know representing you know who Memphis and really putting us on the map in terms of podcasting so I just love that so much Oh no, and I appreciate that. And, and, and the the industry and the craft and the medium is just growing. You know, we, we're we're talking about depending on who you ask. You know, upwards of like uh, five million podcasts are out there now. Maybe not all of them are active, but you know, it just goes to show again that the medium is growing, so it's maturing as well. So you're going to see more of these kind of award shows, award scenarios, and stuff like that. Uh, critical acclaim scenarios, uh, uh, storytelling competition if you will uh mm -hmm. as well so because 
you know, like Essence has a, a podcast storytelling competition. So does Tribeca. And, and these are namestays as far as like media and communications, right? That And they're inviting a uh, podcast uh, into the party a little bit. I, I'll tell you a quick story from the Webbies because uh, the Webbies have been going on for quite a, you know, quite a few years now. I think like uh, maybe 20 something years, maybe I think it's his 29th year coming up or something like that. Uh, but I remember talking to another winner there in a different category, not podcasting. And we were kind of exchanging what we did and stuff like that and say, hey, my name's Dominic Lawson. This is my wife, Kenda. Um, you know, we do a show Black as America a podcast. He's like, oh, you're a podcaster. He's like, man, you guys are taking over, right? Like you guys are really, you know, every year we, you know, when we come to the Webbies or just anything like this, the podcasters are growing more and more. So it just goes to show to your point, Sana, that, you know, the the medium is growing and, and you know, the respect is, is coming there as well. But there's still a long way to go. It's still kind of the Wild West a little bit, mm-hmm. right? You know, but that's with all things, they mature and regulation started to come down. But I'm going to enjoy uh, what it is for right now. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think one thing that we really benefit from in terms of podcasting is that, you know, anyone can start a podcast, right? I mean, and you can see that as a benefit or you can see that as a challenge. Um, But I think, you know, thinking about Black is America podcast, certainly a benefit and an opportunity to tell these stories that typically we're not seeing in, you know, our K through 12 curriculum, or even sometimes in our college curriculum as part of just what we're learning as, you know, the information that we think is important. Um, again, the stories that we tell ourselves about ourselves. And so for Mm -hmm. me, just seeing what you've been able to do in podcasting, particularly with Black is America, I think that really just shows how important this form of media is. Well, it's funny you mentioned that as far as like school curriculum, but the, but but even goes to like even somebody who's like 40, 50, 60 years old, that curriculum just like, you know, going through just trying to learn something. Because let's just take Tom Lee, for instance. You know, I mentioned in the episode that, you know, I didn't know Tom Lee was a black man until, you know, maybe 10, 12 years ago. Right. And so I'm still coming across people today when they listen to the Tom Lee episode that are finding out, you know, here in Memphis that Tom Lee was a black man. You know what I mean? So, uh, again, it just goes to show and just reinforces that these stories are important and they have to be told. And, you know, in a in a place where media, I don't want to say disrespects black content, but I don't think they really see the uh, the true value that it holds. Issa Rae was just talking about recently, like, listen, I may mm-hmm. just have to go back independent because, you know, with all these black shows being canceled, you know, it, it's clear that, you know, the establishment per se uh, is not valuing black stories or even, you know, you know, Asian stories, indigenous stories and stuff like that, you know, uh, but, you know, but, you know, it is what it is. It is what yeah. it is. I'm we're doing black as American. Other people are going to be doing other stuff. So I'm here for it. Absolutely. And I mean, I'm so glad that you decided to do Black is America, because one thing for sure, when you decide to do something, it's going to get done right, as these multiple awards indicate and are evidence of. And so listeners, if you if this is your first time um, about to experience a Black is America episode, you are certainly in for a treat because in every episode, Dominic, you take us on a journey. And I mean, I am in that that journey and so just the storytelling the way that you set the scene for us I mean is absolutely phenomenal and you know again I think that level of storytelling where I feel like and I remember that Tom Lee episode right you really feel like you're in that <laughs> right. so this must mean we got to bring this episode back We need to share that with our listeners, especially since we're here on Let's Grab Coffee on WYXR, which is Memphis's community radio station. We got to talk about this Tom Lee episode and this deep dive you give into someone who has been so central in our Memphis history. So look for that episode later this month. It's just phenomenal. So I'm so glad. Again, I'm just so glad that we're able to um, have this time together and for all of us to listen to some of these shows together over this month. No, I, I, I appreciate that. I appreciate you saying that, you know, you know, allowing the listener to experience Black as America as opposed to listening to it, because uh, that lets me know that we're doing something right. And that's what I want to do. I, I want to put you 
in that scene that I'm talking about. I, I that's why I get very descriptive of you know like exactly where it is, even naming streets. Or you know we kind of get into that when we talk about Sylvia Robinson, but I, I name streets or whatever to kind of put you where where the the story is being told and using you know the editing and the sound design to kind of really put it all together. So yeah, it's it's definitely something to experience for sure. So I, I appreciate you saying that. Yeah, I mean, it is such an experience. And today, you know, we will be experiencing Black is America, the episode about Sylvia Robinson. And I would love if you could just give us a little bit of, I guess, behind the scenes on why Sylvia Robinson um, and how you were approaching this particular story. Right. So, I mean, you know, 2023 was a monumental year in hip hop. It was the 50 year anniversary of when uh, Cool Herc, you know, was in uh, community center and and was getting ready for an after school party and kind of set up his DJ booth and was rocking the party and stuff like that. And and to me, observers, that is the day hip hop was born. And, and so I wanted to kind of observe that with Sylvia Robinson, uh, but also highlight, you know, and we talk about this throughout the episode of the monumental. Uh, 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 contributions women have given to this craft from the, the from the craft itself to the business side and stuff like that and that's where Sylvia Robinson comes in and she was monumental in putting out probably by far the most maybe probably the most important record out in hip-hop history uh rapper's delight you know because that was their first big commercial hit that's the one that spread like wildfire uh across the country uh in a in a very viral type of moment i mean as viral as you can be in in, in the 70s in the late 70s but uh but it was it was very important to tell her story because again you know, we, we look throughout the history of not just all different uh, business, you know, uh, industries, but definitely in music where women have made these massive contributions uh, outside of singing, if you will, and just not being recognized because many of the people who officials, you know, women who official title may be secretary or something like that, acted more as A&R reps, acted more as songwriters, acted more as production specialists. And so I really wanted to tell the story of Sylvia Robinson and like, listen, we owe a debt to that woman, uh, not just for her, her foresight, but also her eye for talent and, and her eye for knowing like what's coming around the pike and, and not just for rapper's delight, but also the message where she goes back to the roots of what hip hop was born as far as that conscious, you know, telling the streets of black America and, and what's going on. So I just thought it was very important uh, to tell that story. And so um, that's that was kind of the 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 impetus for telling uh, the story of Sylvia Robson. I really had a lot of fun doing it. It definitely challenged me uh, in, in a few instances because, you know, it's one thing to do a story about John Fox, right? Because, you know, it's, it's a military story and, you know, you can, you know, do some cool things with like sound design as far as like military sounds and stuff like that. But this one is a little different, right? You won't have to rely on uh, the storytelling and, and, um, you know, why it's important, but also at the same time, you know, make those connections where we are able to talk about other things we'll kind of get into here. But uh, but that was why I wanted to tell that story of Silver Robs. I thought it was important to, and it's not like I'm the first person to tell the story of Silver Robson, but at the same time, you know, I, I wanted to do my part in telling the story of Sylvia Robson. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And I mean, especially as you mentioned, like that tie in with uh, 2023 being recognized as a 50 year anniversary of hip hop. And then, you know, throughout that year, also seeing um, a lot of attention to the women who had been previously very much um, not in the spotlight. Right? right. So I'm even thinking about like the uh, Netflix documentary Ladies First, a story Absolutely. of women in hip hop. So right. even that, um, I got a chance to read uh, Sonia Krishna Murthy's book, Fashion Killer How Hip Hop Revolutionized High Fashion. And she talks mm -hmm. a lot about the different women who were instrumental in, you know, creating different looks or connecting people. Um, something about like April Walker or even Kadita Jones um, and just really foregrounding them because we often. And think about hip hop 
through that very masculine lens. But right. to your point, you know, women were there from the beginning and making very important moves, but often not celebrated. Listen, I can barely dress myself. So if you think, well, if you think it was only me and I doing hip hop fashion and stuff like that, you're sadly mistaken. So I just want to say that really quickly. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. You know, in this episode and listeners, you, you will get a chance to hear it. Okay. I know we're giving you all of this backstory and all of this other information, but I do, what I do appreciate about this episode. And then in general with black is America is you give us the story about the person you're highlighting and the time period and contextualize it. But then you also do those tie ins to right. other topics. And right. that I think makes it even richer to where we get this piece of history and maybe we get several pieces of history, but then we also get those kind of like present day connections as well. Of course, of course. You know, there was, you know, again, you know, like a lot of times when people tell stories, they always stick to the surface level part of the story. Right. But the thing is, I, I think, you know, there, there's so many you know, ways you can kind of just add to the story and connect it to things, right? For example, we, we get to talk to, you know, for a Memphis tie, uh, you know, we get to talk about Gangsta Boom a little bit, right? It, it was the caveat to say like how Gangsta Boom is an innovator in this space, being from Memphis, Tennessee, and how a lot of the MCs today, like Big Glow and Lotto, uh, Juicy Fruit, even, you know, Cardi B and Nicki Minaj emulate some of her style and, and also owe a debt to a Gangsta Boom for kind of paving the way for for women MCs and stuff like that you know or even going back even further with a sister Rosetta Tharp and 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 playing the guitar and how Sylvia Robson was influenced by her but not just you know so uh sister Tharp uh influenced her but like you know your Johnny Cash's your Elvis Presley's and and stuff like that so I, I think it's just you know a, a way to when you're telling the story they're like listen you're going to get the story Right. But you're also going to get so much more than that. And so we always try to pride ourselves uh, by packing as much value into an episode of Black as America uh, as possible. And so honestly, the, the surface level story or the A story, as uh, as uh, my Shiro Shonda Rhimes like to call it, uh, that A story really is just a template. Right. It's a template to add things here and there like, oh, I can connect this uh, to the uh, to this or like, oh, we can probably tie this in a little bit. And honestly, son, it's actually kind of hard sometimes to know to pick and choose what I'm going to put in, what I'm going to take out and stuff like that. And uh, because there's things like, oh, I want to add that. But it's like it's it's a stretch to put it in there. It really is a stretch. So uh, but yeah, that's uh, that's kind of how that's a little bit of how the sausage gets made when it comes to those episodes a little bit, I guess. Yeah, I love it. I mean, again, there's just so much in each episode. Um, and I Again, just kudos to you as a storyteller, as executive producer, right? Making these decisions, both you and Kenda, making these decisions about, okay, what do we want in this in this show? And I know a lot gets left on the cutting room floor or just gets stopped in the ideation stage. It, it, it really, but it, it's hard. It's really hard because, again, for the longest time, you know, as a part of the marginalized community, so many of these stories have not been told or at the very least, they haven't been told enough, right? And so I, I, I will admit there's a there's a little bit of like, uh, you know, feel a little bad that you don't tell that story because it doesn't, you know, because it doesn't, it, like it fits, but it's like it's almost like you can tell it's being forced to fit, you know what I mean? And so you want to make sure that it's, you know, there's smooth transitions and that it makes sense. And so sometimes you feel bad for leaving those stories on the cutting room floor, but sometimes you can just kind of like, you know, it, it, you know, if long-time listeners of Black as America know, sometimes I'll just mention it and like, you know, I will put a pin in that story for later. And it's really an Easter egg to tell that story later on down the road. We did that famously with um, with um, John Fox's episode, and we kind of mentioned Pearl Harbor and stuff like that, which set up Billy Miller the season, the next season. So, uh, so sometimes we can kind of like, you know, kind of just put a little. Oh, Easter egg in there and just kind of set it up for later. Yeah, I mean, things always come back around. They have a they way do. of coming back around. And when the time is right, you could give them that full treatment. Absolutely. Um, and so that is, 
I mean, such an opportunity. I know you learn so much as you're researching for each of these episodes. So there's so much, <laughs> so many stories that you could tell. Um, but we're just so lucky and grateful that you have told these stories on Black is America. Um, since this first episode that we're kicking off the month with is about hip hop, I have to ask for you. Okay, are you a hip hop head, or is it more casual, or that's not your genre at all? But hip hop was my first love. Hip hop is when, when the girls, you know, say you, you, you're not cute. Hip hop always accepted me, right? So I can always go to hip hop and be like, hey, you know, what, what you got for me, right? And then, then maybe they'll have a sad song for me to kind of like, you know, you know, uh, bring in my feelings or whatever and, and make me feel, you know, uh, you know, more confident or whatever. And that's the thing about hip hop, right? It, it, you know, I, I think sometimes over, you know, the 90s or whatever, with the rise of like, you know, gangster rap and stuff like that. Like, oh, that's what hip hop is. It's gangster rap. And it's all about uh, whatever, right? But when you listen to the lyrics of Ice King talk about police brutality, or if you listen to, uh, you know, Chuck D and Public Enemy talk about, you know, fight the power and stuff like that, it's not necessarily about fighting the power per se. It's about speaking truth to power and say like, listen, man, this is what's going on in my community. This is how I'm going to fight it through that medium and through this of us craft so you know hip-hop is so multifaceted you know and and it really is a culture more than just a music if you will right and i think a lot of times the people who are not engaged in the culture don't understand that part it's so much more than music it's 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 the lyricism it's the emceeing it's it's the it's the graffiti art it's all of those things but it's also speaking truth to power it's also talking about what's going on in the community being a voice for good so, uh, but no, hip hop, hip hop is my first love. It, it really is. I, I grew up in the '90s with, uh, you know, with uh, right in, right in the crosshairs of uh, the, the death row bad boy thing and and and, and stuff <laughs> like that. Uh, but yeah, you know, but, but I was always, you know, that Memphis kid who got made fun of when he went to Sam Goody. They were like, "Hey, you, you came to get the new triple six night? Nah, man, I came to get that." Uh, I can't even from the Bumi Smalls, man. Like, man, you don't live in New York. You live in Memphis. Like, man, listen. You know, so, you know, and, and that just goes to show that, you know, uh, you know, BET was, was definitely played in my home. Low MT, you know, raps were definitely played in the home. You know, rap city in the basement and stuff like that. That that's that was my, uh, as a latchkey kid, that was my babysitter, you know, after school. Right? That was my after school programming, if if not. Uh, so, no, hip hop is uh, it's, it's very important and dear to me. So, well, I'm so glad that someone like you was able to give us this episode about Sylvia Robinson. And we are going to take a break. And when we come back, we're going to jump into Black is America featuring Sylvia Robinson. Imagine driving across the Martin Luther King Jr. Bridge on your way home sometime in September of 1979 in East St. Louis, Illinois. It's payday and you're cruising in your Oldsmobile Cutlass with the windows down because it's a beautiful sunny day. You also have your radio on listening to your favorite station, WESL 1490 AM, which plays all of your favorite soul and R&B music. But as you pull up to the light on MLK Drive and North 9th Street, your favorite DJ comes on as they're about to play a new record that everyone has been talking about. They say it comes from New York. As the light turns green, it comes on, and it sounds familiar. It almost sounds like Sheik's song, Good Times, which is cool because you like Sheik. But this is different. And then you hear the vocals. I said a hip hop, the hip it, the hip it to the hip hip hop, and you don't stop the rockin' to the bang bang boogie. Say up, jump the boogie to the rhythm of the boogie to be. Now what you hear is not a test. I'm As you listen, you're trying to figure out: Are they talking or are they singing? This is very different, but you like it. You turn it up because now you have a party going on in your car. But little do you know at the time that you are not only witnessing history. But you have become part of a culture that would not only define what is cool around the world, but this new genre will completely change the landscape of music as you know it.
We come from innovators, heroes, and royalty. We are our ancestors' greatest hope. We face many challenges, but we mold that adversity into our greatest strength. We are the glue that holds a nation together and allows it to flourish. Welcome to Black is America. The podcast that highlights little-known African-American figures and stories that make our history come to life. I'm your host, Dominic Lawson. Episode 1, Sylvia Robinson, the godmother of hip-hop. This year marks the 50th anniversary of a genre of music I hold dear. I tell people all the time hip-hop was my first love. I couldn't get enough of the rhymes, the beats, and the culture. I was a subscriber of The Source magazine here in Memphis, which allowed me to keep up with the latest news, fashion trends, and more. And if I wasn't reading The Source, I was watching Rap City on BET with my guy either Joe Claire or Big Tigger. And being from Memphis, I was so hyped when I saw 3-6 Mafia on the show. I was like, here it is. Big Memphis is finally on the scene. And while on Rap City in 1998, Gangsta Boo, who was part of 3-6 Mafia, but also had a new album that just released at the time. Here she is talking about what she wanted to accomplish in the rap game. Have you heard of the saying, a closed mouth won't get fed? No, but I just did. <laughs> closed mouth won't get a fed. A closed mouth won't get fed, and so I'm saying, like, if you don't open your mouth and say what you want, you ain't gonna get it. And so what I'm doing is opening my mouth, telling people what I want in the industry and out the whole, the whole world. You know what I'm saying? Like, get it while the getting is good, get it while you can. Mm -hmm. Instead of on some commercial stuff, I'm like straight out thugging. Right. Ghetto queen with mine. You know what I'm saying? Coming from the hood. Unfortunately, earlier this year, Gangsta Boo or Lola Mitchell crossed the ancestral plane. She was a pioneer in the Memphis rap game, paving the way for Memphis stars today, including Glorilla and Juicy Fruit. But Gangsta Boo's career highlights something else of note. And that is the representation of women and their undeniable contributions to the culture and business of hip hop. Now, before you think I wanted to be a rapper, that couldn't be further from the truth. No, I wanted to be an executive producer and create projects. So while I did love the biggies and the Tupacs of the world, I was a bigger fan of executive producers such as Sean Combs or P. Diddy or Puff Daddy or Diddy or whatever he's calling himself these days. I, I lose count after a while. Or a Dr. Dre who was instrumental in crafting the West Coast sound of the day. Honestly, I'm secretly living out my executive producer fantasy through podcasting. But growing up, the missing thing was the celebration of women on the soundboards and in the boardrooms. I know they existed, but I didn't have an opportunity to look up to them because it was always just men that I saw in magazines and in the music videos. But this is interesting and ironic because when it comes to the commercialization of hip hop, there is a strong case that it started with one person, Sylvia Robinson. Now, we know that hip hop started in an apartment building over on Sedgwick Avenue in the Bronx when my guy Clive Campbell, aka Cool Herc, along with his sister and two turntables, were throwing a back-to-school party on August 11th, 1973. The party lasted until 4 a.m. the next day, undeniably the beginning of a culture that would change the world. But it was underground and wasn't on the same level as, say, disco, soul, R&B, or rock and roll. But all of that changed in 1979 with the release of Rapper's Delight, thanks to Sylvia. But who is she? How does she make hip hop the global phenomenon that it is today? Well, that story begins not too far from the origin story of hip hop itself. Sylvia Robinson, or Sylvia Vanderpool, was born on May 29, 1935 in Harlem to her parents, Herbert and Ida Vanderpool. She would later attend Washington Irving High School, and it would be fitting that she did because there is clearly something in the water at that school when it comes to notable alumni, creatively speaking, of course. That is because Washington Irving boasts many alumni who have awards in the arts, including Academy Award nominee Gatteray Sotabay from the 2009 movie Precious and EGOT member and host of The View, Whoopi Goldberg. 
And if you're wondering what it means to be an EGOT member, that means Whoopi has won an Emmy, a Golden Globe, an Oscar, and a Tony. It's a very exclusive club. So exclusive that when you think about all of the actors, musicians, and writers who have ever existed, only 17 are on that list, which includes John Legend and Jennifer Hudson. And I'm sorry if I went on a historical tangent just now, but if you're new to the Black is America podcast, just know that's going to happen from time to time. And if you're a longtime listener, hey, you knew what this was. Also strap in because it's going to happen again pretty soon. But the point I was ultimately making is that Sylvia was in good company as it relates to her school, and she would pursue her musical ambitions early on dropping out at 14, beginning a music career with Columbia Records under the stage name Little Sylvia. And under the tutelage of Louisville, Kentucky guitarist Mickey Baker, Sylvia learns how to play the guitar, and they form the duo Mickey and Sylvia. And it doesn't take long for her to find success. Massive success. One that still bears fruit to this day. Now, there is some dispute about who wrote what, so I will just say that in collaboration with famed rock and roller Bo Diddley, they created the hit song Love is Strange. Now, that song title may not sound familiar, but when you hear it, you're probably going to go, oh yeah, that song. Let's see, shall we? This is Mickey and Sylvia performing their song on The Steve Allen Show in 1957. Uh, Mickey, you did not want to record Love is Strange, and Sylvia talked you into it. What did you say to him to win the argument? I said, come here, lover boy. And here it is, Love is Strange. Yeah. Love, love is strange. Yeah. Love is Strange went on to number one on the R&B Billboard charts on March 6, 1957, and number 11 on the Hot 100. And the people who covered this song since then reads like a who's who in music. Buddy Holly, Sonny and Cher, Peaches and Herb, even Kenny Rogers and Dolly Parton. Not to mention the TV shows and movies it's been used on, including those like my wife, who are fans of the 1987 Academy Award-winning Dirty Dancing. It's even featured on the soundtrack, which is one of the best-selling albums of all time. But there's something about Sylvia playing the guitar that was interesting to me. I mean, when you see women's musical groups of the 50s and 60s, I'm talking about groups like the Supremes, fancy dresses and choreographed moves come to mind. And Sylvia had all of that, but with a guitar. But now that I think about it, she wasn't the only black woman out here shredding it up on the music scene during this era. But to show you what I mean, we need to take a trip across the pond and then catch a train to Manchester, England, because literally there's a performance about to happen at a train station. And as we pull into the station, it looks like the show has already began. I can hear the music and the crowd enjoying it. It looks like we got here just in time. Oh yes, we have found her, all right. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to introduce you to Sister Rosetta Tharp. Didn't it rain, children? Rain, oh yes. Didn't it? Yes, didn't it? You know it did, didn't it? Oh, oh yes, how it rained. Sister Tharp is an African-American singer and guitarist who sung a mixture of rock, blues, and gospel. Her popularity rose in the 30s and 40s. Her unique style has been influenced by some of the greats of her era and beyond. We're talking Chuck Berry, Elvis Presley, Johnny Cash, and today's stars like India Irie, Eric Clapton, and Tracy Chapman. But like many legacies in Black America, Hers has become more appreciated as the years have passed. She was posthumously inducted into the Blues Hall of Fame. Her performance of Down by the Riverside was selected by the National Recording Registry for the Library of Congress. 
She has also been the feature of multiple documentaries from American Masters and BBC4 in the UK. But I think the ending comments from a 2017 NPR piece sums up her legacy quite nicely. Quote, she was a gospel singer at heart who became a celebrity by forging a new path musically. Through her unforgettable voice and gospel swing crossover style, Tharp influenced a generation of musicians. She was and is an unmatched artist. Didn't it, yes. Didn't it, you know me, did it, didn't it? Oh, my Lord. How it rang. Sister Tharp would have influence on another dynamic duo, but it would be Sylvia Robinson that would collaborate with them directly, landing them their first Grammy nomination. And speaking of Sylvia, her and Mickey would go on to create other songs, but nothing as big as Love is Strange. The two would officially break up, but still collaborate. Sylvia at this time is now focusing on her solo career. She also meets and marries Joe Robinson. Joe is a Navy vet that didn't have any problem getting money. He had a numbers racket in Harlem that he flipped into investing into several nightclubs. Sylvia, during her solo career, would expand her music acumen, getting more into writing and producing music for other artists, including for a famous couple of the era. Darling, yes, Tina. you're starting to get next to me. Honey, that was my plan from the very beginning. Darling, uh-huh. I never thought... In a 1981 interview, Sylvia said that she was heavily involved in the production of the Grammy Award-nominated song by Ike and Tina Turner, It's Going to Work Out Fine. However, she is not given credit for the production. Unfortunately, in the music business of male-dominated industry, specifically during this era, there are countless examples of women working in the industry who may have had the title of secretary, per se, but acted more like AR reps, writers, producers, and more only to not get the proper due they deserve. This happened to Sylvia on more than one occasion. She clearly had a talent for writing and creating hit songs and an eye for finding talent. And I guess Auntie Sylvia had enough with the BS and along with her husband took matters into her own hands. So in 1968, Sylvia created all platinum records in Inglewood, New Jersey. But just to show you how savvy of a record exec she was, Look no further than the name of the label itself, All Platinum. That is because Sylvia knew that vendors paid traditionally in alphabetical order. So in naming it All Platinum, Auntie wanted to ensure that she was one of the first people to get her coins. Now, while Joe handled the business side of the label, Sylvia was free to create a roster of solid acts, such as the Moments, the Whatnots, and create soul hits like the Shirley and Company record, Shame, shame, shame. But the label's biggest hit would come from the label head herself. In March of 1973, in a song she originally wrote for soul legend and Memphis native Al Green, Pillow Talk became the label's biggest hit. It spent two weeks at number one on the best-selling soul charts and peaked at number three on the Billboard Hot 100. And it was also nominated for a Grammy in 1974. Soul music had a nice hold on the radio airwaves. You had Motown in Detroit, Stax here in my hometown of Memphis, and along with Sylvia and Joe Robinson at Owl Platinum, they were having success in New Jersey. However, a new sound was forming across the Hudson in the Bronx. And that sound was moving throughout New York City to the basements, living rooms, rec centers, and parks of the five boroughs. And if you found yourself at a block party at the time, you can hear the familiar sound of your favorite soul or R&B songs, but the songs were being played by DJs, 
and there were different lyrics being provided by a person called an MC. The job of the MC was to speak rhythmically over the music, making observations, telling stories, expressing their opinions. And when you looked over to the side, you would see people on broken down cardboard boxes doing what you called break dancing and people spray painting or tagging a wall with some of the coolest art you will ever see. And these four things, DJing, MCing, break dancing, and graffiti art would make for the four pillars of a culture known as hip hop. And from that culture, some people will start to make a name for themselves. There's DJ Cool Herc, who I mentioned earlier, and often regarded as the father of the music. But there's also African Bambada, Grandmaster Flash, Curtis Blow, and others. But this music wasn't all about partying and having a good time. New York City in the 1970s was going through a transition with great social and economic change. And so hip hop was a way for these young black innovators to express themselves, channeling some of the same tenets of the great civil rights leaders from just a generation ago. It was Chris Rock who put it best. It is black America who decides what is cool and the rest of the world follows. But what these teenagers and young adults created on the streets of New York would change American society forever. So as hip hop is coming more into his own as a culture, not many people outside of New York knew about it. That's due in large part because you couldn't hear it on the radio. DJs and MCs were actually weary of being recorded for fearing of people stealing rhymes or their sound. Also, some of the musical sessions would go on for two, three, maybe even four hours. Not exactly radio friendly when you think about the average song being played around that time was between two and a half to three minutes. So how would this sound make it out of the five boroughs? Where is the origin story of when the phenomenon that began in the streets of New York would turn into a global force it is today? This is where Auntie Sylvia comes in. See, in 1979, All Platinum Records was not doing so well. They weren't churning out the hits as they were before in years past, and they were accumulating debt. In addition to artists leaving the label, Joe's under-the-table business dealings led to an investigation and a conviction of tax evasion. And all of this led to All Platinum filing for bankruptcy. But one night, Sylvia is invited by her niece to come to a party at Harlem World a nightclub on the corner of Lennox Ave and 116th. And it was there that Auntie saw something. She loved the call and response dynamic by the DJ who was rapping over the break of the hit song Good Times by Sheik. Sylvia looks at her son who was there with her and says, this would make a great record. She also says, this is going to get us out of bankruptcy. As we have proven throughout the course of this episode, Sylvia has always had an eye for talent. But what she pulls off next would make her a musical legend. So Joe Jr. goes and gets three of his friends, three inexperienced rappers from New Jersey, Henry Jackson, Guy O'Brien, and Michael Wright. You would ultimately come to know them as Big Bank Hank, Master G, and Wonder Mike. They meet with Sylvia on a Friday, and on the following Monday, they record. The three MCs will write their rhymes while Sylvia gets the label's house band to play the instrumental of Good Times. And in one take, the song Rapper's Delight by the newly formed Sugar Hill Gang was created. It's 15 minutes long. Not exactly the two and a half to three minutes piece we talked about earlier, but nowhere near three hours either. But now, the real work begins. It's time to get it on radio. But no one in New York wants to play it. I'm sure their logic was, what is this? If I wanted to play something that sounded like Sheik's massive hit Good Times, I would just play that. It's kind of ironic when you think about it, isn't it? The birthplace of hip-hop did not want to play its very first record on its radio station. Not exactly a fairy tale beginning to global domination, is it? So she sends the record all over the country, I imagine to all of the major cities. But it ends up at the doorsteps of WESL in East St. Louis, Illinois, and ultimately in the hands of program director Gentleman Jim Gates. 
he would ultimately be inducted into the St. Louis Radio Hall of Fame. I have to imagine some of the reason he is inducted because of what he does with this record next. He listens to it and he likes it. And he wants to play it on air. But what did he hear in that record that DJs in New York and around the country didn't get? Well, I'll let him tell you himself. Here is Jim Gates from his St. Louis Public Radio interview. They're rapping over, this is Sheik's music. That made it passable because Sheik had sold about 10 million records already. I said, I like that. I'm going to play that now. He goes over to the studio and hands it to Edie Anderson, or EDB, a DJ at the station at the time, to play. And let's just say she wasn't thrilled about it either. The last hour of my show was always the special hour. It was an hour of something. And usually it was ladies back to back, Aretha and Gladys. <laughs> and so, so when he came to, to me and asked me to play this song, that's what was going on. I was in my last hour. I'm the girl that was trying to sneak jazz into R&B. And all of a sudden, I got to play rap with my R&B. I get a letter, listen, you got to play this. I don't want to, I said, you got to play this. I'm going to be in my office listening, you know. Like, ooh, she was almost crying. When I put it on, it was like a hippity hoppity hoppity. I'm like, what is this? Lo and behold, um, when I put it on the turntable, people just started calling up, what is that? The phone to WESL ring off the hook. For the kids listening to this podcast, this is the equivalent of going viral before social media. From there, Rapper's Delight was an instant hit. From coast to coast, people loved it. I mean, it's hard not to like. It's just a fun record, and I think if hip-hop was going to work commercially, you needed something fun and light. Rapper's Delight would peak at 36 on the Billboard Hot 100, number four on the Hot Soul singles, number one in Canada, number one on the Dutch Top 40, and number three on the UK charts. The song was so popular, Sylvia was asked to cut it down from 15 minutes to seven, so that way it can be played on pop stations as well. The song would serve as the anchor single on Sugar Hill Gang's debut album, and Sylvia would change the name of the label from All Platinum to Sugar Hill Records, just like the name of the group and the neighborhood in Harlem. And Sugar Hill Records would become a multi-million dollar success. She would also sign multiple acts that were successful. The Treacherous Three, Funky Four Plus One, and others. Sylvia even produced some of the music videos for her artists with a young director at the time, Spike Lee. But one group would be exceptionally important, not just for Sugar Hill Records, but for the evolution of hip-hop. With all of the success Sylvia had with the Sugar Hill Gang and Sugar Hill Records, not everyone was happy about it. The originators of the art form didn't understand how come it took three inexperienced MCs, not from the birthplace of where it started, to create its first commercialized success. And some thought the success of Rapper's Delight took away from the important issues that those who created the art form spoke about. Drugs, poverty, and police brutality. But the savvy record exec, Auntie Sylvia, knew that for the importance and for the evolution of hip-hop, she not only had to put out fun and great music, but she also had to get out what was going on in the streets. Signing Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five to create the hit song, The Message. It would have large scale success, just like Rapper's Delight, and be considered one of the greatest songs of all time across any genre by Time Magazine. In addition to that, it has been credited by many to be a key point in hip-hop history. Until then, hip-hop was all about the DJ, but with the message highlighting Melly Mel acting as a news reporter with his lyricism, he was able to show the hardships of what was going on in the black community, not just in New York, but across the country. 
So as you can see, Sylvia certainly put her stamp on what we know and love today is hip hop. However, Sugar Hill Records would fall on hard times. For starters, came competition. Now that Sylvia had provided proof of concept that hip hop was commercially viable, other labels and acts came into the game. Many of the founding hip hop pioneers were starting to go commercial, not to mention new players in the game, including the likes of LL Cool J, Run DMC, and their hit Sucker MCs. And then White America got in on the craze because you knew they would with the Beastie Boys, not to mention their label ran by Russell Simmons, known as Def Jam. But in addition to the competition, there were financial and legal problems. And just like before, talent was leaving Sugar Hill Records, which would fold in 1986. Along with it, Sylvia and Joe would divorce. Now, in 89, Sylvia would create a new label, Bon Ami, with a new group from New Jersey called The New Style. But that label would tank. But not necessarily the group. In a sign that once again Auntie Sylvia had an eye for talent, that group would resurface about two years later, but under a new name. You know them today as Naughty by Nature. She would make one more attempt to create a new label, but no success. Sylvia would pass away due to heart failure September 29th, 2011. 32 years to the month that she changed the music landscape forever. She was 76 years old. In 2022, she would be inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame due to her contribution of bringing hip hop to the masses. And that makes sense to me. When you look at the resume, you cannot deny her impact on hip hop and the legacy that has continued to pave the way for many, especially women. Missy Elliott made history in 2019 as the first female rapper to be inducted into the Songwriters Hall of Fame. And there are more women execs at major labels now than ever before. Not to mention what we are seeing in the rap game right now, which could arguably be a golden era in the world of women MCs. Cardi B, Megan Thee Stallion, Glorilla, and Lotto. And speaking of Lotto, she recently sat down and gave commentary on what's happening right now. Because it's been Nikki for so long, so, you know, they made they made us feel like it could only be one at a time. And now we're rewriting that story and it's a little different. It's uneasy. It makes it makes the industry feel like it's coming. They done figured it out now. And as more black women continue to shape and craft the evolution of hip hop, they owe the opening chapter of that story to Sylvia Robinson, whose insight proved correct time and time again making her a master at her craft. It proves, as Muhammad Ali would say, champions aren't made in the gyms. Champions are made from something they have deep inside them. A desire, a dream, and a vision. And that is why Sylvia Robinson is the godmother of hip-hop. The Black is America podcast, a presentation of Owl's Education, was created and is written, researched, and produced by me, Dominic Lawson. Executive producer, Kenda Lawson. Cover art was created by Alexandria Eddings of Art Life Connections. Sources to create this episode include National Public Radio, St. Louis Public Radio, BBC4, American Masters, Billboard.com, and more. For a complete list, look in the show notes of your podcast player or our website, www.blackisamericapodcast.com Be sure to like, review, and subscribe to Black is America on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you like to listen to podcasts. Also, let people know what you think about the podcast. We would appreciate that very much. For a full transcript of this episode and other resources, go to www.blackisamericapodcast.com There you can read our blog, leave us a review, or you can leave a voicemail where you can ask a question or let us know what you think about the show that we may play in a later episode. You can also hit the donation button if you like what you heard, which helps us to create more educational content like this. Finally, thank you for listening to the Black is America podcast, where our history comes to life. Until next time.